This is a series of screencasts to discuss some sample final exam questions that we had for the 2013 Winter 2 term, the January to April 2014 term. So these exam questions should be reasonably representative of what you might see on an exam, but it's sample questions, so we get to ask things that are vaguer than what you might get on an exam, or longer than we could reasonably give, or all kinds of other things. Uh, in, in this case, I'm just going to try and work through all the problems, um, but it's not going to be exactly like an exam. For instance, you'll notice that uh, there's no point values associated with the questions. This is worth zero points, and the rest of them are all going to be worth zero points as well. But I did want to mention before we get started, some of the things that I would do if I were working this exam and it were a real exam. And the very first thing I would do is to skim through all of the questions. I'd skim through this tautologies and contradictions question we have at the start here, and just quickly read what it's asking me to do. So I'm determining whether statements are definitely true or definitely false, or true or false depending on the values and definitions, the variables, domains, and predicates in the expressions, and so on and so forth. And I'm just going to glance through this. It's multiple choice so that's kind of promising for maybe I will work on this because uh, it's probably going to be quick I'm certainly not going to leave it blank when I'm all finished because there's nothing in here about being penalized for guessing so I might as well guess uh, and you know something like Q and R arrow F I think I'm going to be able to figure out pretty quickly whether that's a tautology or contradiction so I'm going to think of this as not too hard a problem and expect to come back to it and do it early and then this next one gives me ooh, a big, messy-looking theorem. And then it says to imagine using a direct proof approach to prove this theorem. For each quantifier, indicate whether I will prove the quantifier or assume it. And if I'm proving it, indicate whether I get to choose the variable's value, and if so, on the basis of which other variables. If I'm assuming it, I give examples of how I may, might make use of the assumptions. So this is a big, messy statement, but I'm actually only going to deal with each of the quantifiers. There's what? One, two, three, four, five, six of them. So, you know, this, this question might be a bit of work, but it doesn't look too hard to me right up front. So again, I would mark down a note or two on my exam to say, yeah, I ought to come back to this question. Uh, here we've got a circuit design question. Design a circuit that, given these two inputs, determines the remainder when i is divided by the pth prime number according to the table. So when p is 0, it's prime number 2. And when p is 1, it's the prime number 3. And the remainder should be an unsigned binary number of the minimum bits necessary. OK, so I'm finding a remainder. Uh, well, I mean, this isn't going to be too hard. This is a circuit design problem. I've got four bits of input. Worst case, I'm going to make myself a 16-row truth table, and I should be able to design things. How many outputs will I have? Uh, I don't know. It's going to be the remainder of this division. Oh, well, I'm only dividing by two or three, uh, so that remainder is going to be maybe two bits. So I don't expect this to be a really hard circuit design problem. It'll be more time-consuming, probably, than the previous two questions. But again, this is something I'm definitely going to come back to. So, number representation, Java language specification has the following to say, a whole bunch, the C++ language has the following to say, more whole bunch, answer these questions, Java was designed so that programs written in Java could be compiled on any type of computer, um, C++ was not, discuss how these design targets affected the language specification. So I'm actually going to have to read through this to answer the question. Let's see how many parts there are to this. Uh, let's see. Is this guaranteed to be correct is what this next question is going to ask me. Some sort of test to see whether in values are negative. Um, if it takes 32 hexadecimal digits to represent how many bits long is it? Oh, well, that's going to be easy. That that doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the problem, so I might mark that. I'm actually going to erase that so we can come back and solve this problem separately later on, but if I were going through the exam at this point, I'd mark that as, I can answer that one. That's not too hard. A floating point number is like a fi the fixed point representation we learned. Let me just jump down so I can read the rest of that. Do I think float and double types can precisely represent 1 11th? Why or why not? Well, that, that sounds like sort of the one-third problem that we did in class, so I, I might be able to come back and do that. If Boolean were actually represented in the computer using the same amount of space as a byte, how many wasted bit patterns would there be? Well, assuming there's nothing special in the specification up there, it's just going to be true or false, so that takes one bit. 
and bytes typically are 8 bits, but I'll check the specification. So this also looks pretty easy. It looks like the C, D, and E parts of this program are not too hard, but A and B look pretty time-consuming, so I'd probably mark them as such, and at least come back to C, D, and E early on. I might wait on A and B, because then I can avoid doing all that reading until a little bit later. Okay, and then this one. Give a direct proof approach, no proof by contrapositive or contradiction, no logical equivalence that is complete as possible. If there's choices, be sure to give. So this is this is the typical direct proof approach problem we've seen a few times before. And again, this is a big theorem, but it's going to be straightforward. We, we know how to do this. You know, when I see the universal, I'm going to use without loss of generality to strip off that universal. So I'll definitely come back to this problem. I know just how to solve it. It might take a little bit of time. Okay, consider this big, nasty-looking circuit. Assume that all of the flip-flops start with the value 0. Assume that input is a sequence of bits provided by the user, and that the clock ticks each time a new bit is available. So I'm going to have... where is input? Oh, there it is. So I'm going to have a bunch of inputs coming through here. Um, that sounds painful, actually, because it's a large enough circuit that it might be hard to figure it out. Um, give three different input sequences of different lengths that all lead to outputs of one. So it's going to be figuring out what this what this circuit is doing, how we get a one here. Give an input and a state such that when the clock ticks, both flip-flops change their stored values, or explain why no such input and state exists. That's going to be tricky, too. Uh, briefly explain in English the meaning of the left flip-flops value. I'm going to have to figure out the circuit to do that. The right flip-flops value, I'm going to have to figure out the circuit to do that. Briefly explain what it does in English. Again, and then modify the circuit so it outputs 1 exactly when the number of 1's input to the circuit is divisible by 4. Wow, so that's basically a brand new circuit design problem. So F is, is going to be tricky unless this problem pretty much tells me how to do this, so I'd probably mark this one as quite difficult and maybe come back to it last if, uh, unless it's worth so many marks that I feel like I really need to do it. Okay, so that, that problem is, that problem looks like it's going to be tricky. I'll probably leave that one till later because it'll take a lot of time. A predicate logic problem, and if I'm really reading this description of a domain for the first time, we've got sets and we've got predicates and that sort of thing. I'm going to leave this till later, too, just because that's going to take a long time to read. So we're going to define a couple of predicates, and we're going to make some statements about the domain, three of them. You know, you're going to have to judge how good you are at predicate logic yourself. Uh, I, I feel reasonably confident when approaching these, but I'm the instructor, so uh, obviously that's different for me. Uh, I, I would probably come back to predicate logic, because I feel reasonably confident I can solve whatever problem is posed here, but I also feel like it's going to take me some time, so I'm not going to prioritize coming back to it right away. Uh, indirect proof. Consider the theorem every DFA either accepts an infinite number of different inputs or rejects an infinite number of different inputs, or both. Prove the theorem using proof by contradiction, and no other steps preceding the contradiction step. Okay, so this is a proof, and it's kind of risky, because a proof can take a long time to do if you sort of don't get the insight involved in the proof. A long time to finish, that is. But the flip side of that is that starting a proof isn't that hard. I mean, this is a proof by contradiction, right? So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to negate this theorem, and then I'm going to assume that negation. And the very last thing I'm going to do is find a contradiction. So I kind of know the rough structure of this problem. I'm definitely going to come back and fill in that rough structure. Whether I actually solve the problem or not, that's going to be a question of uh, how hard I find it to, to make progress. So when I do come back to this problem, I'm going to keep a careful eye on how much time it's taking me. And if I feel like I'm not making progress, I'm going to set the problem aside and try some other problem instead. And that's that's all there is to this problem. Uh, sets and functions. So I've got a couple of sets. Is the empty set a member? Is the empty set a subset? Those, I mean, I don't know offhand until I look at the sets, but that's going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, give an injective function from A to B or explain why no such function exists. That's, that's probably going to be straightforward. Give a surjective function. Give a one-to-one -one function. Uh, why is this different? Oh, uh, oh, okay, so this one's injective from A to B, and this one's injective from B to A, okay. Um, yeah, that's that's not going to be too hard, I don't think. 
This all looks pretty straightforward. Uh, what is the cardinality of the power set of A? I know how to figure out cardinalities of power sets, so that should be no problem. What is the power set of B? Hold on, how big is B? Let's see. Okay, B's got three elements. Well, that's going to be a little annoying, but it shouldn't take too, too long. Uh, in terms of A and B, what is the domain and codomain of a function F that... Ah, uh, this is too long to read. I'm going to come back to this one later, but I, I'm going to guess it's probably not that hard. The rest of these don't look too challenging. This is definitely a problem I'm going to do early on, because I'm confident I can answer all these questions, and I'm confident I can check my answers too. So this is a really low-risk question. shouldn't take too much time. All right. Design a deterministic finite automaton that takes as input a sequence of bits, 0 or 1, and accepts exactly those sequences that include at least three bits. Of which, of which at least two are zeros, so for example, blah 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 should be accepted, and blah blah blah, and the empty string should be rejected. Okay, this is a DFA design problem. Um, those can be kind of time consuming. I, I know how to approach it, so it might work just fine, um, but I'm not going to mark it as come back to it right away, because it's, it's certainly going to take me a fair bit of time, so I'd probably mark it as something to try early on, and if I have trouble, then I'll skip it. Um, and then write a regular expression that matches the same set of strings. Now, writing a regular expression for a problem, regular expressions in DFAs are equivalent. They, they can solve the same kinds of problems, but they're very different representations. So sometimes it can be a lot easier to write a regular expression, sometimes a DFA. So I, I'm going to try both of these. They're both a little bit risky in the sense that it might take me a long time to solve them, but you know, this problem may be easier to write as a regular expression, or it may be easier to write as a DFA. So I'm, I'm not going to give up on both parts just because I get stuck on one of them. Uh, I will try the other part and see if it's easy. All right. Proof. For all A, for all B, exists an N, N greater than B, and N squared greater than AN plus 1. Well, I mean, there's not much more here. Uh, it's just a proof. Um, I think this is going to be similar to that indirect proof that we discussed earlier. Sometimes proofs take a lot of insight. There's a ton of structure here that I can use, so I think I can make lots and lots of progress on the problem uh, before I even have to uh, before I even have to think hard uh, in terms of insight. I mean, I'm going to have to choose a value for n, and obviously that's going to be tricky. But I'll just I'll leave that blank until I get further along in the problem. And I imagine I'll be able to get a lot of part marks. Uh, then I'll try actually finishing the proof, and maybe I can do it, maybe I can't. Again, if I if I find I'm spending a lot of time, then I'll skip it. And that is it for that problem. <laughs> One tiny prompt at the top of the page. I got a physics test once that looked like that, and the question was, why is the sky blue? That was a hard question. Okay, working computer. Our working computer's instructions come in various lengths. Why are some instructions longer than others? Um, I kind of know the answer to that already, so that's probably not going to be too hard. What part of an instruction indicates how much memory the instruction takes up? Oh, and I, I already know that one. Okay, so I'm definitely going to come back to this problem. It might take a little while to write up my answers, but otherwise I'm not too worried about it. And is there a part C? There is no part C. Okay, so that's one I'm going to mark as definitely come back to. DFA implementation. Ooh, that sounds like a circuit. Those things take forever, so right away I'm going to think this one I might leave until later. I mean, depending on how many marks it is. And again, we've got zero marks here, right? So allocate your time according to the marks. But I've got this DFA here. Um, what state will this be in after... Oh, well, well this is going to be easy. I mean, I'm just going to trace this string through, so uh, I'll answer A, definitely. Would this DFA still be legal if we change state 0 to be an accepting state? Uh, that's, that's easy, too. I'm going to answer B. We're not implementing it yet. Would this DFA still be legal if we eliminated the arc from state 5 to itself? Yeah, I can answer that, too implement this DFA as a circuit. That's going to take a while. I might skip part D and come back to it, but I'm going to do A, B, and C. For any positive integer n, the nth Fibonacci number f sub n is defined to be, and here we've got a definition of the Fibonacci numbers, prove that the sum of two odd numbers is an even number. That's got nothing to do with this. This and the next two problems probably not by induction. Oh, okay. 
uh, prove that the sum of two even numbers is an even number. I'm pretty confident about those. Uh, prove that the sum of an odd number and an even number is an odd number. Something about the Fibonacci numbers, maybe? Oh, I've altered this a little bit so it'll be easier to go through, so I've got an extra copy of this up here because I knew I'd need that definition for the later problems. Prove by induction that every third Fibonacci number and no other is, is even. Okay, so we've got an induction problem. I mean, I have a recursive structure given to me right here, so I... I think I can do the structure of the induction problem anyway, but there will be a recurs uh, there will be an insight in there somewhere probably in the inductive step that I may or may not be able to get. So the same sort of thing as I've said before can take a long time to do a proof, but the structure is not too hard. Do we have more? We have more. Prove by induction that twice the sum of the first k even Fibonacci numbers is equal to the sum of the first three k Fibonacci numbers. Same deal as before. Let's see. More induction. Prove by induction that adding 1 to a binary number with b bits, blah blah blah, changes no more than 1 0 bit to a 1 bit. That's a familiar sounding problem, uh, but you know, it's an induction proof again, so I'm gonna come back to this with the same comments as for the previous two induction proofs. And, and indeed for the previous proofs as well. We still don't know what binomial cues are, but we can learn something about them. Binomial cue is made up of many trees. Shape of the tree in the zero slot. This is Okay, this is too complex. I'll read this later. Proved by induction. Uh, this has got nothing to do with binomial cues. Now that looks like a, a pretty straightforward induction problem, the kind that we've solved a few times. Some summation and some uh, quantity that that's equal to. So I figure I'm probably going to be able to solve that, but otherwise the same comments as on all the other proofs we've already looked at. This is just a repetition of that definition that I skipped earlier. Using the results from the previous part proof by induction that there are two to the n nodes. You know, I'm not going to bother reading this. It's an induction proof, so same thing as earlier. As long as I can find the recursive structure, I can make a lot of progress, but I can't necessarily finish it. Based on the previous parts, prove however you would like that the sum of the number of nodes in the trees in the first k slots in a binomial queue is equal to 2 to the k minus 1. Oof, I don't like however you would like. That sounds like more work for me. Um, this is a proof, and it, it's not obvious necessarily how I'm going to proceed because of that however you would like. So this is something I would probably leave until last, personally. I mean, maybe it'll be easy, so I'm at least going to give it a bit more time later on, just in case I look at it and go, oh, well, that's obvious. Uh, but it sounds like a hard proof to me. Prove however you would like that for all natural numbers k, the tree in the k plus 1 slot of binomial q has the same shape as the tree in the k slot. Ah, uh, okay. Forget it, I'm skipping that. Another prove however you would like. And... Oh! And that's all. So that was that was just a review of the questions. Um, obviously, you don't want your review to take as much time as I have. I've just spent most of 20 minutes reviewing the exam here. You're going to want to go a little bit faster. But you can flip through the exam pretty quickly and just take a quick look at the questions. I mean, if nothing else, notice, you know, this is a multiple choice question. I should do this multiple choice question quickly. Because it's going to save you a lot of time later on in the exam when you can say, you know, I shouldn't do those prove however you want problems until I've given myself a chance to solve, say, that, that set problem where I felt like I could solve each and every one of those. They weren't super hard questions. So that's my initial approach to the exam. If I were doing this in a real exam, I would have done little marks. Uh, what I tend to do is I put... Um, question marks to say how risky a problem is, like I might put one question mark on this problem because I don't find it very risky, whereas those prove however you want, so I might put like three question marks on to say I don't really know how much progress I can make, uh, and then I'm going to put stars on to say how easy I think it is, so this one I'd probably put like three stars on to say, oh I think this one's pretty easy, and just one question mark. So that tells me I should come back to this problem, I think it's pretty easy, I don't think it's very risky. I can probably solve it correctly very, very quickly. And I'll just look at those annotations as I'm going through the exam, and I'll do the easy ones that are worth a lot of marks first and that, that aren't risky. All right. I'm going to erase these marks, though, because this isn't really doing the exam. This is doing a run-through of the exam for you. And that is all I have right now. Uh, the next video, I will start in on one of the questions.